two, one. Excellent. Okay, great. So uh, we're, we're recording. I'm with Brecky von Bitcoin. Uh, how are you today? I'm good, man. I uh, woke up. I took my new puppy out for a walk, and uh, right. You were saying you got a new puppy. When? Good. When? When did you get the puppy? Uh, I got him probably about three weeks ago now. So he uh, he's, he's settling in. His name is uh, is Toshi after Satoshi, of course. Beautiful. So, Toshi Papamoto. <laughs> And uh, he's stacking sats. He's a good dog. Okay. Okay. I like it. And uh, first time puppy owner? Uh, first time puppy owner. I grew up with dogs, but uh, this is my first dog. So. Okay. Okay. So I guess it's not too much of a shock then if you grew up with dogs. No, I was going to ask you because I, I, I got two little girls and I probably have about a hundred little toy puppies around the house. Like yesterday, literally, we made like a, a two hour mission just to go buy this like particular one called Barker. And it's just a toy. And I'm just like, I think at one point we're going to need to make the leap here. But but any 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 uh, I guess any anything uh, um, I guess what's the hardest part about it <laughs> before we move on to the more other well, things here? <laughs> I, mean, I, I grew up with dogs, but, you know, like my mm. parents didn't like force us to take care of them. Like they always did the walks and the feeding and all that stuff. So, you know, the it's just, you know, it's a lifestyle adjustment in, in a good way, you know, like I've been trying to get on a better schedule to wake up in the mornings and, you know, and work out more. And now I have to, so, you know, I have to go on walks, have to get up early. Um, but, you know, as a dad, I don't think it'll be too much of a leap from, from, from real dadhood to dog dadhood. It's, uh, <laughs> I don't know how, like, I have so much res more respect for my parents now because they, you know, were raising three young, young children and they were raising dogs. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Uh, wait, did you say you're a dad too, or you said you're? You no, said no, this no. is preparation for that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Dog, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool, man. So, um, as, so as I was saying earlier, you know, I, I'd like to, um, so maybe maybe I'll preface this by saying that you know you are the creative, you know, uh, director at Swan Bitcoin, right? And as I was mentioning earlier, uh, before we went live here, is that in my mind, and I've been around since 2011, 2012, right, is, is that I really truly feel that Swan Bitcoin has done a great job of kind of capturing the, the zeitgeist of, of kind of the, the mind share of a lot of, um, of the people in Bitcoin, right? And so, so you being the creative director, I'm really excited uh, to talk to you today. Um, so first things first, what is, as I was mentioning also earlier, is, is that I'd like to ask you, what's your story? Um, you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, what's your Bitcoin story, but more so like, what's your story? And, you know, really kind of like, what was your lens coming into Bitcoin? Um, curious, and, you know, what, what kind of things earlier on, uh, you know, captivated you in life, like whether it be about money or technology or whatever, just curious about, about your backstory. Sure, man. So, um, I mean, growing up, I grew up in South Florida, kind of a, lived in a, you know, very nice area, kind of a bubble type of thing. You know, I went to, you know, I went to a nice school up in the Northeast, blah, blah, blah. And like my family background is, um, you know, my, my grandpa's a very successful businessman. So I kind of had this like this view of Wall Street that I thought was I thought was kind of cool at the time. Like I was young and I saw like someone in my family had been successful and I kind of I looked up to him for those things and I still mm. do. But, um, you know, he, you know, he's in like the, he was in like the, the corporate takeover world. He's kind of a Gordon Gecko type. Right. <laughs> and uh, so I went to college and I started studying Russian actually, uh, among other things, because he had done business in Russia and I went there on a vacation with him before college. And I was like, whoa, this is the wild west of business. Like <laughs> there's like no laws, like people are bribing people to get business deals done. I'm like, this is exciting. <laughs> um, and so I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just wanted to work outside of the United States and get some, you know, some more experience elsewhere. Mm. So I started studying Russian, thinking I would go live in Russia and do some do some sort of business over there. Right. And I also studied um, international relations at the time. So those mm. two kind of things went hand in hand. Um, I ended up spending um, a summer in Moscow interning for a real estate company and uh, quickly realized why my ancestors had left that, that country. I did not enjoy it. <laughs> Okay. okay. Um, and I had already signed up to uh, to do another six months studying abroad there, so I was miserable. And I went back home for a little bit, and then I went right back to Russia. And um, while I was there, what's really interesting about Russia at the time, you know, they, you know, communism fell, right? Uh, and they sort of embraced capitalism in a way like. Like they were, it's almost like they were making up for all that lost time. Like you had everyone kind of pilfering the state and taking advantage of whatever they could. And, you know, 
consumerism was like materialism and consumerism was so in your face more even more so than here like in moscow mm. you'd go up you know down the uh you know into the the subway and there would just be ads for everything and i was just i was kind of disgusted by the materialism and it kind of sent me down this this path of reassessing what i wanted to do with my life um you know the importance of of making money was less so in my mind at that mm. time um, and i was miserable so i was watching movies um, to kind of like, you know, br break out of that, that sort of uh, malaise, if you will. And I was like, why don't I make movies? Why don't I do what makes me happy? Um, and so I, I quickly pivoted. Um, I wrote my senior thesis in international relations on, you know, how governments use their national film industries for propaganda purposes. Um, and I ended up getting an internship in Los Angeles and went and worked for a big producer there. I worked at a talent agency for a little bit. Um, and I ended up going to, to film school out here for producing. Um, and eventually, while I was in film school, I, uh, and after having had some experience like actually working in the film industry, I had yeah. another realization, which was that I much prefer watching movies to making movies. Um, you know, part of why I wanted to get into film was to make the world a better place and to, to make movies that are both entertaining and good for you. Mm. Um, like, for example, like Django Unchained, like that movie, I read an interview once by a guy named um, Re Reginald Hudlin, who um, was Tarantino's producing partner. And Tarantino basically said to him, look, man, uh, like there are lots of movies out there about slavery, like or TV series like Roots. Roots is amazing. Everyone's seen it, but kind of boring. Like it doesn't really mm -hmm. stir you. And Tarantino was like, screw that. OK, we can do Roots, but really entertaining and badass. And like that really influenced my my philosophy in terms of of you know creating content because um, it, it really brought in a lot of what I've learned in terms of propaganda as well is like you know if you want propaganda to be effective it has to be entertaining at least that's what I I came to to believe mm. um, you can't just start preaching to someone you have to you have to get them in you have to get them interested um, so sort of around the time where, you know, well, I, I basically come up with that sort of philosophy. That's why I'd gone to film school. I wanted to make movies like that, movies that stirred what, people, changed what, the world. What does the word propaganda mean? I mean, I know what it means, but what does it actually mean? Do you know what I mean? It, it, like, cause I, you, I think you're using it in a positive sense here, right? But usually so, propaganda is kind of in a negative sense. Um, I feel like the word anarchy is sometimes subject to the same type of, uh, exactly. you know, word abuse. But, but I'm just curious, like when you say propaganda, you're talking about what? Like shocking people at mass scale type of deal in a positive way <laughs> or getting their attention? Or what? To me, propaganda is a tool. It's neither mm. good nor bad. Everyone uses it. Something I came to realize that I had been essentially brainwashed by like, it, it, maybe in a good way, okay way, by the American film industry. I mm. didn't realize how much, uh, how interwoven the American film industry was with the military industrial complex. Mm. Um, like you go watch a movie uh, that, that involves the military and as long as it portrays them in a, in a decent light, the military is providing those helicopters, those planes. Like movies can't afford $50 million airplanes to, to make these movies. You know, but these movies will go and permeate through throughout the world and it's soft, it's American soft power. You know, it's it's showing the might of, of, of America and building this narrative everywhere else. So mm -hmm. it really does benefit the US to to cooperate with Hollywood in that sense. Um, so in terms of propaganda, it's it's you know the how do you phrase it? It's it's spreading a message in a way that's effective, I think. Mm -hmm. um, lots mm -hmm. of different of it but you know to me it's not necessarily good or bad it's a tool that regimes across the world use that people use that bitcoiners use and that's kind of how those skills have tied um back into what i am currently doing interesting um, interesting no no I, I, okay so continue continue so yeah so where, where did your story go next yeah so uh so in film school i was trying to you know make these movies and out of film mm -hmm. school I produced a, a movie or two and then you know realized like making a movie is very, very difficult, which I, I knew, but in terms like, it's not very effective. So kind of towards the end of film school, I um, became bitten by the Bitcoin bug for the second time. <laughs> when, um, when, around, when around a couple years ago, or when was this? This was in 2016, 2017. But my first like dive into Bitcoin was actually before I went to Russia. Um, because I heard all these stories from my grandfather about how the banks over there are corrupt and you never know if you're going to get your money. Right. And I was thinking to myself, 
um, this was in 2013. I'd heard about Bitcoin uh, probably a bit earlier with that Rolling Stone article. Um, yep. and I prior in my life, I maybe had a small addiction to World of Warcraft. So I understood like in-game assets and, you know, like e-gold. Um, so Bitcoin made sense to me. I was like, oh, digital money. This makes total sense. I should probably get some before I go to Russia in case, you know, I can't access my bank. Like I need money that is mine. So I was not a, I didn't know what a blockchain was and I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't understand Bitcoin at all, but I was kind of, I had, I was kind of a proto Bitcoiner in that sense, right? Like I kind of understood some of the value props there. Um, and also it, it didn't hurt that like my background is Jewish and I'm, I am Jewish. And so, you know, having to have family pick up in the middle of the night and leave all their wealth behind, like that prepares you pretty well for, for Bitcoin, for unconfiscatable money. Mm. Um, Anyway, so 2013, this is a bit of a flashback. I buy some Bitcoin uh, at the top, right at the top of that pump. And we crash down to like 300 and I become a hodler. And I didn't even know the word hodl at the time. Um, and then I kind of forgot about it again until the beginnings of the run up. Well, to- that, that, that doesn't make sense. So it, it, it dropped in price and you became a hodler. So how, how does how did that happen? I mean, oh, like, you know, I looked at, you know, I, I bought my, I bought two Bitcoins in 2013 for, uh, a little over a thousand dollars each right, price right. Out at 300. And I said to myself, well, I could sell, but that doesn't really make sense. And then I'm just taking, uh, a okay. Got you. Got you. Okay. So I, I was like, all right, I'm just going to hold on. <laughs> okay. Okay. Smart. Okay. Yeah. And so then flash forward again to when I'm uh, kind of coming out of film school and this is probably late 2016, early 2017. Um, and, you know, prices are going back up again. I'm starting to pay attention again. Um, this is when I, I became a shit coiner, um, because earlier I wasn't a Bitcoiner. I was just somebody who held Bitcoin. Um, so I, uh, was really excited by everything that was happening. Like a lot of folks in the space, but I also saw, um, there was just so much scammy bullshit going on. Like so many, like I was on Instagram and all these scams were there. And so I, I needed a creative outlet and I started making fun of them. I started doing like parody videos, making fun of these scammers, um, and it kind of grew into this Brecky von Bitcoin persona. I was originally crypto Brecky, and uh, when I made it over to Twitter, it, it switched over to uh, uh, no, I was my, the my fake name was Crypto Breakfast. That was the handle because okay, every okay. I wake up, I'd have breakfast, I'd talk about <laughs> crypto bullshit, whatever's going on. Yeah, when I went to Twitter, the handle was taken, so I was like, all right, we'll make a crypto Brecky, and then when I when I went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, which I'll, I'll get into, I was like, I can't be, have crypto in my name anymore. So it became Brecky von Bitcoin. And the reason for the, the Germanness of the name is for the first probably year, two years, no, was it two? Maybe it was two years. I was kind of semi privacy conscious. Mm. So I never spoke with my actual voice. I always spoke in a fake German accent, kind of making fun of these like silly influencer types. Um, I even go to like conferences and then like, I never broke character. So for a, for a while, people like still like, it doesn't happen anymore because I obviously like let that go a while ago when I became more serious in the space and sort of dropped the silly clown character that I was, that I was playing. But uh, anyway, for a while that happened. Now I was basically, when did it happen? I don't know exactly when it happened, but you know, a number of people reached out to me um, as like my account was growing and uh, one guy on, on Instagram was like a, a massive meme account, crypto humor was like, yo, dude, you got to like, you got to really dive into Bitcoin. You got to stop like randomly like posting about shit coins. Like you're going to get wrecked. Like you don't know what you're talking about. It was like tough love. And I was like, hmm, okay, maybe. Like at first I scoffed. I was like, yeah, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Crypto, the revolution, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Uh, and then I started listening to Tales from the Crypt. And that's really what did it, actually. I think probably after, you know, two or three months of listening to this podcast really solidly, Marty and Matt, just they got to me. I, I finally read the Bitcoin standard and really started doing my research and realized that all the other shit out there was was what it is, shit. Um and at, around that time, I was like, I need to work in this space. This is the revolution. This is what I want to, this is the most important thing that I could be devoting my time to. How do I do that? Um, and so I got a job working for a company called Tantra Labs, which uh, kind of offers like a similar product to BlockFi. Good guys. Um, they were Bitcoin only at the time. I, I'm still friendly with them, but you know, not, they weren't really helping with adoption the way that I wanted to be helping with. Mm. Uh, and so 
I was part-time there and I was working on artwork. I was making Bitcoin art kind of on the side and that's still something I, I do. Um, but I had become friendly with Corey Clipston because we're both in Los Angeles, a mutual friend um, put us together and I became an advisor to Give Bitcoin, which is now part of Swan Bitcoin, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, it was a really cool uh, way to like gift Bitcoin to people with a time lock and you know, maybe we'll bring that back at some point. Um, and then he told me about Swan and I was like, all right, I'll work part-time here, part-time there. Um, and eventually I was like, I was enjoying the work at Swan so much that I was like, guys, I'm sorry. You know, I, you'll find someone who's more motivated than me to help you with your mission, but this is my mission over here. I need to be part of this team. I need to work for Swan. Um, and the rest is uh, kind of history. So here, here when, when did you, okay. So actually before that, even by the way, I wanted to say, I, I, I just the last half an hour. So I've been watching all your Morty. <laughs> oh, I didn't even talk about those. <laughs> oh my God. They've got like 8,000 views on some of them. The ones you did a couple years ago, but they are insanely funny. And then, oh my God, the, the Christine Lagarde one. I <laughs> This was my second time because I think I'd, I'd come across it once before on Twitter or something, but that is like insane. Um, uh, Yeah. So I, I, I'm loving this, man. I mean, uh, yeah. And I always wonder like why more artists aren't, you know, like in Bitcoin, like it's, it's kind of, it's rare almost. Um, but it's, it's something that needs to be done. And uh, I think, you know, maybe it's, maybe you're, you're going to help usher that, 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 that revolution in. Um, hey, anything else on your story there, Brecky, before we move on to Swan, maybe a bit more deeper in terms of, I mean, you, you kind of uh, shared a lot of crazy, I mean, amazing things there. Um, but anything else on, on that note in terms of, I don't know, just uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Before we move on. Um, I think that's it, man. I mean, I'm glad you watched the Rick and Morty videos. That was a so uh, funny. <laughs> I don't know what I, my brother and I were living together at the time, and we just we were both huge Rick and Morty fans. And there was like one scene in particular. I don't remember what, what it was, and I was like, I got to turn this into a Rick and Morty thing. So I, I like doing voice work, and uh, that kind of that's actually what launched me into like the into I don't know C, C level celebrity, whatever you want to call it, in Bitcoin. That's what first got me my my break on social media because they would just go viral every time, and I really wish I had more time to do them. And so, but we'll see. I, the last one I did was um, was was making fun of Craig Wright and the trial around with Hodel on all that stuff. Um, so I'll, I'll send that okay. one to you later. Yeah, but it, I don't uh, think I've seen that one. Yeah, <laughs> do you check? I'll put a link in the. Okay, so 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 I'm I'm a big fan of like all this artwork and everything that you're putting out there. Um, and so yeah, so that that's great. That's great. And 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 so you know my 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 you know uh, this thing or whatever I'm doing here, I'm calling it building on Bitcoin. And the idea, Bitcoin stories, right, is kind of the thing. But it's like building on Bitcoin's the theme, and the thing that. I um I'm really excited about is is helping people uh like a lot of people are like oh my god this thing is crazy you can make so much money you can get rich and freedom and this and that but what I'm trying to get more people to do is to realize that you can also carve like your full-time gig like you can work here you can build a business you can go work for someone you can write a book you can write a you can make a song you can do whatever you want um so 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 this transition then from you know creating Rick and Morty videos more for fun it seems like right then kind of moving into this like full-time swan gig uh or swan bitcoin gig is is an interesting one for me so 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 how does that happen first of all like what is i mean what is it about Corey's pitch on on swan and like everything about it that kind of you know captivated your imagination but i think you also missed like what is it about bitcoin um that really you know initially caught your your, your attention as well but if you can segue into the swan side that would be awesome Sure, man. So, I mean, yeah, how do you talk about Bitcoin in a short period of time? You know, it's, I, I don't know, I think I was always one of those people who didn't like being told what to do. I was probably, I, I probably should have been a libertarian a lot earlier. Um, and Bitcoin is just pure freedom, you know, like I, I realized I'd kind of been brainwashed by, um, by the state, by, you know, going to school here. Um, and I was very, I grew up, I was a very patriotic person and I still love America. I am patriotic, but my, my views on patriotism have changed, hmm. you know, and I think brings us back to a closer vision of what America was intended to be. Mm. Um, and so to me, it's all about personal sovereignty. It's about 
about your individual rights. It's about, you know, improving the rights of, of everyone over the world, across the world. So there's a, there's a lot to why, um, why I love Bitcoin. Um, and but it, it, I asked because, you know, at the beginning you were saying how like your, your relationship with Bitcoin is very, uh, you know, uh, distant effort. It was just like something that fulfilled the need. You're like, I need my own money type of deal. Um, Then you're making like videos about it to more shit on other like scammy projects to kind of help people. Right. Um, uh, But then, but then now you're like, okay, I'm going to like dig into this and I'm going to like, you know, work in it full time. Right. So, so just, yeah. So, but, 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 but what, but beautifully said though, pure freedom. I mean, when people ask me to like the word freedom is the first word that comes out of my mouth as well. So, um, okay. So, and then, and then, then what is it about Swan Bitcoin? And, you know, by the way, for what it's worth, I don't know if you know this, but I started essentially like the first Bitcoin company in India, right? And and so when we've tried a lot of things, we're still in business, we have 2 million users, we've tried a lot of things over the years. And if somebody would ask me, like, if I was starting a business today, what would be the one thing that would make the most amount of sense? I'd be like, yo, DCA Bitcoin, straight up. Like, that's it. Like, that, that's the only thing that matters where people hold their own keys, because everything else has been more experimentation to get there. But, but, but how did, how did you get to that realization? Was it something that uh, on a personal note was something that Corey told you? Um, I think like a lot of people, I, I lost a bunch of money YOLOing into to, to shit coins <laughs> in 2017 and realized yeah. very quickly that, you know, in order to be a, a successful trader, you need to be treated like a full-time job and I am not a trader. Um, so at that point, I, I started kind of DCAing on my own, but you know it was very difficult to do. I you know I would, I'd set reminders, I'd forget whatever. Um, and so when I heard the pitch, when Corey was like, "All right, this is what we're doing. We're going to make it the easiest way to buy Bitcoin automatically," I was like, "This is a product I need and I want. Let's let's make this happen." Um, but part of the other thing that I love about Swan though is is like the company ethos. You know, like it really aligns with everything I was doing. Like I was. Let me take back to what you were talking about with artists. Yeah, so yeah. <clears throat> there aren't that many what I would call Bitcoin artists, right? There are a lot of crypto artists out there. Um, and you're so I, right. I define a crypto artist as someone who is using the technology of cryptography, forgetting, let's not talk about which chain it's on. They're using crypto to benefit their art. And I think that's cool. A Bitcoin artist to me is someone who makes artwork about Bitcoin to push Bitcoin forward. It's not, mm. it's not it could leverage Bitcoin in cool ways, like using involving the technology, like I embed open dimes in some of the pieces I've made, but that's not the focus. The focus is to get the word out about Bitcoin, like crypto right. cryptography. He is a Bitcoin artist like that. He is like the pinnacle of Bitcoin art, like his, his billboards out there mm. are one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Um, and so that that sort of view on on what Bitcoin art is, you know, basically my ethos there is like, Go out, do what you want. You can make money, but it should be in service to Bitcoin. Like your personal brand should not be ahead of Bitcoin's personal brand. When you see people who do that, you you know, people call them scammers or like opportunists. Like that is, yes, there's an opportunity with Bitcoin. I think there's an opportunity, like you said, to carve out your niche, to, to do something really cool, but it's also to contribute to Bitcoin itself, mm. whether it's the protocol, the community, the, the adoption, you know, like and, and that's what Swan is all about. You know, like the, when, whenever we come up with an idea at Swan, like pretty much the first thing we ask ourselves is, is this good for Bitcoin? And if the answer is yes, and it's also good for Swan, then we do it. You know, it's, it's, it's about doing right by this movement and not just about doing right by yourself. Cause you can, and I, I totally believe that you can do both. It, it always goes back to like entertainment. Like what I was saying, like you can make a movie that's good for people and a movie that is highly entertaining. They're not mutually exclusive. You can make money doing that. You can educate, like all these things can happen at once. You don't have to limit yourself. Are you the creative genius behind the Swan Bitcoin YouTube channel? <laughs> uh, no. Or one of the, or okay. I'm just wondering, cause you guys have something like that, right? Or, or am I mistaking? <laughs> it's kind of a, it's a team effort in a lot of ways. Swan's yeah, yeah. was Brady's baby. Um, and it's grown into its own. I host our, our Swan Lounge show, which is more like a hangout and talk about the week's events and things like that. Is that, that. on Clubhouse or is that on YouTube as well? Uh, that's on YouTube, although sometimes we've done them on, on Clubhouse, both that kind of thing. Interesting. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, but you're right. I think uh, the ethos, or I think that's the word you use, right? It seems like you guys have a lot, lot of. Um, I've been also chatting with uh, Robert Breedlove. I think he, I'm going to be on his show uh, soon, or vice versa. We're going to figure that out. But, but all the the guys you guys are, or people you're working with, seem really on point. So uh, good on you on that one. Hey, but you know, you said quickly like Swans the DCA, but right, I, and I kind of said the same thing. But like, do you mind? Uh, Maybe just like explaining what it is, like dollar cost averaging. But are you only in the United States? Is it available everywhere? Is it hold your own private keys? Can you just kind of give us that? Because I want to make sure people know what you know we're talking about here. Yeah, for sure. So uh, we primarily service the United States. Um, we allow people to set up a an auto DCA plan. So you can say, I want to buy Bitcoin either every day, every week, every month, mm. that kind of thing set the amount, um, it pulls from your bank account automatically. Um, of course, now we also have instant buys, so you can buy, you know, and you can buy an instant amount in addition to your, your, your uh, weekly, daily, monthly plan. Um, and I don't, you don't need to have an auto plan if you don't want to. Um, we are actually serving international customers, um, but only by wire um, and only for larger amounts for right now. Um, so if anyone interested in that, you can just swanbitcoin.com slash private. Um, so, uh, that's exciting, but hopefully we'll expand, uh, to the rest and of the world. When, when did Swan Bitcoin come? Like when, when did you guys serve your first customer? Like, Ooh. is that, yeah. Do you know? I'd say a little over a year ago. I think we've been around for about a year now. Maybe I'm off. Plus or minus a few months. I so, forget. So, so, okay. So, okay. So a big part. So again, uh, you know, um, like startups, uh, my, I think my Twitter handle before it was uh, whatever sunny ratio, it was, I think it was sunny, sunny startups for like years. Right. And like, one thing I know is, is that for startups, like growth is like oxygen. Like if you're not growing, you're dying. Um, and, 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 and so sometimes moral or ethics and and growth don't always go hand in hand like it's hard to stay on this on the straight and narrow to be like yo we're just going to do this one thing um and that's our only guiding light like it's so easy to obviously drive growth by playing around the edges if you know what i mean so how, how does swan bitcoin maintain that straight and narrow but at the same time um maintain growth which it sounds like you guys are doing at least from i don't know like from the outside at least it seems like you guys are doing great on that great on that front sure so i mean part of what we wanted to accomplish and i think we've done it by now is we wanted swan to be the most recommended place to buy bitcoin in the us we wanted it to be the place where people are just like you got to use swan um and in terms of how you know how you kind of toe that line of needing to get growth while also like, you know, maybe adhering to a set of morals, let's say, um, you know, I'll use like podcasts as an example, you know, we at, at Swan, we are pretty much, I think everyone on the team is a maximalist, like to work, to work at Swan, like you must, maybe not a maximalist, but you must be a Bitcoiner. Mm -hmm. Like nobody, there's no non-Bitcoiners working, working at Swan. Mm -hmm. um, now, a lot of us, are, are you know out there going on shows and podcasts and things like that and talking Bitcoin all the time, um, and you know sometimes often we'll we'll get asked to go on shows that are not Bitcoin shows you know they're mm -hmm. crypto shows and they shill things that we wouldn't shill mm -hmm. and so we ask ourselves like should we go on this show and the answer is always yes you know if we're out there spreading the good word about Bitcoin that's totally okay now we're not going to have you know a scammer on our show. <laughs> Um, but if, if we can, if there's a chance for us reaching people at somewhere else, like that's totally cool with us. I and mean, that's just like one example, you know, we've also kind of been luck, lucky. I mean, we've worked our asses off, but you know, with the, with the pandemic and with the rise of Bitcoin, you know, it's, we've just onboarded growth has not been a problem. You know, we've had <laughs> lots, and lots of customers, Bitcoin has grown, you know, we've, we've seen lots of institutional people come in through Swan as well. Interesting. Uh, and, you know, DCA is just a great strategy and it kind of sells itself. Um, so there's that and, you know, the education we put out, like we like Swan Signal Live and, you know, some of the articles we put out and the, the book giveaways we do, you know, our focus is Bitcoin and we put that front and center and mm. people, people gravitate to that. And, you know, I think this, for the same similar reasons why I did and why many others do. Yeah, man, I totally can get behind that. And, and hence, uh, you know, Bitcoin stories, right? Because I was like, you know what? There's so much noise, but what's the one thing I really care about? 
Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. So I, I've even I've even interviewed like co-founders of Ethereum and and you know uh, Ava Labs and stuff. But but I always kind of look at it through the lens of a Bitcoin maximalist. Um, and, and if for nothing else, just for my peace of mind, you know what I mean? Like uh, everything just check all the boxes are checked when you think about Bitcoin. Everything else is just so many holes. It's like Swiss cheese. Okay, so I, I love I love uh, Swan Bitcoin. Love what you guys are doing with that. One thing before we get off that topic, Clubhouse. You guys have essentially taken over clubhouse um <laughs> like every time i go on there it's either now it's now either nvk or you guys like it's <laughs> but it's mostly you guys so um i don't know what, what what's been that relationship like with clubhouse you know i i did see this something this morning uh some gentlemen posted like they're they're kind of they're, they're struggling with i think retention and some of the some of the things like people are dropping off but uh, the you know but but to me it's just like mind-blowing right like, like like it feels like a conference in your pocket type of deal but but what's what's yeah what's that been like <laughs> for sure one second let me just close my yeah mind. pause it here my face is uh so clubhouse uh basically you know we were having a, a marketing meeting and Corey was like all right everybody stop i've got to tell you about this thing called clubhouse <laughs> <laughs> going to be huge it's going to be massive and and he's basically saying he was on there and there were lots of scammers and lots of affinity marketers and people like spreading bad knowledge about bitcoin and he's like we need to stop this we need to fix this uh all hands on deck we are going to devote a lot of time to clubhouse so that we can uh get people on board with bitcoin um and in the beginning um it was mostly us um we founded a club called uh cafe bitcoin um, it's since grown to, I think we're at like 60, 70 or 80,000 followers plus what? members as well. Um, what? Yeah. <laughs> oh my Lord. Okay. It, it, it's wild. And uh, that is insane. the whole time was to basically make it a community resource. And, and I think we've done that and, and I'm working to schedule more events, but you know, on Wednesdays, for example, we have um, the lightning lab. So the team from lightning labs, you know, comes in and talks yesterday, Elizabeth Stark was there and it, cool. you know, it's, always, it's always good. It's more and more high level stuff. I'm talking to Desiree from lightning also about doing like a lightning one-on-one we do uh, twice a week, uh, beginner Bitcoin Q and a. So it's usually myself and I try to loop in people like Stefan Levera or BTC sessions or Guy Swan. And we just sit there and we, we answer beginner questions and we go for a few hours and it's always, it's always fun. Um, and we've also brought on, um, people to we basically created a community of moderators and hosts to kind of do rooms all the time so there's always a room going on each day but then there are one-off rooms or we also have recurring events as well in different languages so like we have i think we have bitcoin in french german spanish portuguese uh there's a bitcoin india hour there's i'm trying to get a bitcoin no after way. going there's Wait, a, when is the India? When is the India hour? Because, like I said, we have a, a lot of, I think, followers in well, Canada, India. Those are the two maybe big places, um, and the U.S. But, uh, but in in India, when do you guys have that? So that's at five thirty IST. Nice so, every I mean, day. You sorry or no? What day? I think it's every day. I don't think I'm awake for it. So I, it's I, crazy. I, you, okay, uh, so you guys. So so is it is it paying off? Is Corey's kind of call right? <laughs> Uh, I mean, you know, 70,000 followers, that seems pretty ridiculous, but uh, yeah. I, I definitely think so. I mean, it, it's, you know, it's a community resource. It, it's for people to kind of learn about Bitcoin and like, just even from a personal level, you know, being on Twitter, I've, I've kind of felt not, I didn't realize, but mm. there's a distance from like people who are new to the space on Twitter. Like even someone who's new on Twitter isn't that new, mm. you know, they're here in these clubhouse rooms who are brand new to bitcoin they've got great questions they just want to learn and it's amazing to see you know the bitcoin the good bitcoin ed educators flock there and share their time and resources it's, and it's crazy there's like there's really smart people on there there's mm -hmm. really smart people on there um if the clubhouse people are listening or whatever, any recommendations or things that, that bug you about it? I mean, I mean, to me, the one thing, the sign up process and the gate was always yeah. weird, like the iPhone and like, it's like, you got to do jumping jacks to try and even get in. But, um, but other than that, like, I mean, are there other, other things that you, you wish they'd kind of change to make it even better for, for people like you? Um, I think they're just, they're, they're working on the app, you know, it's new, you know, mm. Like, is it available on android yet or no or did they go live yet i don't know yet but I, I heard it's coming soon there is actually an open source version that you can run on your computer um 
as long as you have an account already, which is, I've, I've seen some people do that. Um, but with Clubhouse, know. say again, cool. with Clubhouse, there's an open source version of it. Uh, I think somebody reverse engineered it, but it works with the app, something like that. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Okay, so it's so, okay. Like I said, I think the Swan Bitcoin story is really an interesting one and um, and like a success story, right? In many ways, it sounds like so happy for you guys. And I, and I really believe that, yeah, you can make money and, you know, do good at the same time. So it sounds like you guys are doing that uh, in spades. Um, okay, should we move on to the next topic or anything else you want to share on Swan? Um, uh, I've got one thing or two. Yeah, things please. Um, so we actually have something that uh, a project called Bitcoin TV that is kind of been on the back burner um, for a little while. Mm. Um, but I'm, it, it's basically a 24 hour stream of, of great Bitcoin content and you can find it on our YouTube channel. Um, but I've just recently finished like a UX upgrade for it and adding new content. And so I'm uploading everything now and that's going to be, uh, we're going to, we'll be announcing that again as well, but that's really cool. And then of course there's, uh, Bitcoin 2021. So if anyone's going to the conference, Swan is going to have a, a giant lounge there with all sorts of fun activations. And, you know, I don't want to share the details yet. You'll come stop by the booth and, uh, and come have some fun with us, but uh, we'll be in Miami. We'll be celebrating. So amazing amazing yeah i can't wait till conferences become a thing again that's uh okay and, and i guess florida's open right florida's free so our <laughs> freedom exists there <laughs> to some extent um and, and by the way covid i guess clubhouse is a bit of a reaction to that right in some ways but uh but 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 uh has that i mean uh is that posed i mean that's obviously posed a challenge for everyone but have you guys just been able to kind of navigate around it and it sounds like you guys are you know making the best of a bad situation here yeah, I mean, Swan is a team. Like we've been, we never had an office. We've always been remote. You know, we've got mm. people in Germany, we've got people in, you know, multiple states and, and now countries. So it's, uh, in terms of how the company works, that's that's been fine. You know, and, cool. And you're, yeah, go, go for it. Yeah, no, you said you had a couple other things you wanted to share. What was that? Uh, was there anything else? Oh no, it was just uh, Bitcoin TV. I just I'm Bitcoin sorry. TV. And what is that? How do you how do people get there? Like, was it Bitcoin.tv or on YouTube or? It's on our YouTube, but you can go to BitcoinTV.network. Um, and- okay. And it's like 24-7, all day, every day, like just Bitcoin content live. Okay. That's, that's amazing. Bitcoin content, we have a, you know, a live price ticker and block height and everything else there too. So you never have to, you can always look at the price if that's your, uh, if that's what you want to do. But uh. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. And then, and then, and then people could just like leave it on and listen to it, you know, and it's just like uh, constantly. Uh, well, that was the, like the, the impetus for it. Like we were, we're all working on Bitcoin stuff and we were somebody who did one day, I think, maybe, I think this was Corey's idea to do this initially, but you know, it was like, I wish I just had like something playing in the background, like CNBC, but for Bitcoin. So that was kind of the idea. Um, and it's all, um, there is some newer content, but it's not, it's, there's nothing live yet except for the price information. Um, but it's basically curated Bitcoin content. So, you know, you go there and you watch and you know, okay, this is going to be good. You know, this is a classic talk from Andreas that everyone needs to watch, or, cool. you know, this is, you know, an old episode of Max Kaiser that like sent someone down the rabbit hole and you need to watch that too. You know, nice. um, it's a nice mix of sort of, educational content, entertaining content. Um, I've, I've gotten a lot of Bitcoiners to record themselves doing a video being like, you know, this is so-and-so and you're watching Bitcoin TV, you know, kind of like the old MTV videos a little bit. Oh, boys. And there's like little interstitial videos that are just like funny mimetic videos that like you might've seen on Twitter, but like wouldn't expect to see on like a, a television stream kind of thing. So it's, uh, we try to keep it fun. Cool. Cool. Well, no, I love it. I, I've actually been to it a few times and uh, I like it. I like, I like what you I like everything you guys are doing, man. So, uh, with the whole clubhouse thing. Um, I think that's awesome too, right? Like why not? And, and I think you guys are doing it artfully. I think you're, like you said, educating people. And so people should, you know, people should check it out. Um, okay. What else? Okay. So then the third and kind of final big question was what's one thing that you believe to be true that most others in Bitcoin would disagree with you on? Uh, yeah. All right. Um, I guess this is in the Zate guy, so let's talk about it a little bit. Um, I think that there is a place for NFTs on Bitcoin. Um, NFTs actually started on Bitcoin with Counterparty, uh, for those who are around for that. Um, and they're coming back, I believe, in a big way on Liquid and on Lightning using the RGB protocol. We're not quite there yet, um, but I think it's coming I think a lot of Bitcoiners are very anti-NFTs in a way. Um, and I think this stems from sort of like the, 
you know, the sound money perspective and, and understanding like what a blockchain is actually for. And I don't necessarily disagree, like the highest function, the best function, like the, the greatest use of a, a blockchain is Bitcoin. It's money, sound money. But that being said, you know, I think there are some really interesting applications for NFTs like video games. Um, you know, even if the NFT is sort of a, an access token to using like, you know, a spaceship, like Samson Mao has this game coming out called Infinite Fleet that I'm really excited about because I'm, like, I'm a Star Trek nerd where you get to like fly around the galaxy and do space things. But, you know, you get to own your spaceship and you could sell it afterwards, you know. So within like the context of like a walled garden of a video game, I think NFTs do make sense. And I think there are a lot of use cases that don't make any sense at all, but I am open to them as long as they're on Bitcoin in some fashion. And then, so I guess a lot of Bitcoiners would, would, would uh, disagree, but that's okay. <laughs> no, I, 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 I'm not, uh, I can't say anything too negative about that comment, to be honest. Uh, I don't know. For me, it's always like, like before I learned about Bitcoin, I was, an, I was, an, I, I'm, and I still am an enthusiast for, of freedom of, you know, and, and of, you know, of art, creativity, money, all these things. Right. So, so to me, I try and look at everything through the lens of like the, you know, free markets, like all these things. Right. So, so I try not to be too hard on, on any, per, any particular, you know, worldview. Cause I mean, what, what do I know? Right. I'm just like, just a random dude. Um, but I, I do think there's an energy. I was going to ask you one thing. Have you heard of RSK rootstock? I have, I don't, know much about it i'm not the most technical person smart but. contracts on top of bitcoin right. uh you know i've been interviewed i've interviewed diego and all these guys i i think there's something there i i actually you know I, and by the way I'm, I'm from toronto so you know even guys like ethereum and all i mean guys like ethereum guys like vitalik um and all of them well, are, are the from here way, so that makes sense yeah yeah yeah, yeah. essentially yeah <laughs> and i've been you know pretty outspoken about my uh criticisms of of the project over the years you know but uh but at the same time free market, you know, he's free to do whatever he wants. Like, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to tell him not to, but, but I do think it's not enough to just sit around. I do think that people who do believe in Bitcoin should speak up. And that's why I'm doing like a daily video or whatever, you know, and you're doing the work that you're doing. Um, okay. I think that's a good one. And that's a good one. NFTs on, on Bitcoin, you know, bring it, bring it. Haters, trolls, bring it. I'm going to disable comments. No, <laughs> um, no, I'm okay. So, okay. Uh, two kind of, I guess, trailing things um one thing is uh, ai is that even in your like i know most bitcoiners are kind of like tunnel vision right now but do you think about ai much uh do you think uh it's it's something that's i don't know that that people uh you know from an art artistic perspective you know they've got uh ai can create art uh, i don't know if you've listened to their tupac remakes and I, I've, I've listened to a lot of it on open ai i've gotten access it seems like, you know, that, that AI could do a lot. I don't know. Anyway, but any thoughts about like, well, okay, I guess two questions on that one. So AI and how to leverage it today to get your work done and to be more creative and productive. And secondly, this like more esoteric, long-term general AI that will, you know, be like a million times smarter than all of humans combined and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But do you have any thoughts on, on those two things? Any? <laughs> um. It, it's not really something that's in my life these days. I, I was really impressed when, when we, all, we saw everyone playing with GPT-3 like earlier in the year, last year. That was really cool. Mm. Uh, so I, I don't know. I don't know how I could leverage it. Yeah, yeah I'm semi-worried about the Terminator. But, uh, the main <laughs> thing, but uh, you know, I think that we're, we're nowhere near, you know, real AI. So uh, that's not really a concern right now. Um, I'm here for it. You know, I'm... I, I'm uh, I love new technology. I'm, I'm excited to see what happens, but uh, you know, my focus is on, is on Bitcoin. As long as AI is not a threat to Bitcoin. AI, if you're a threat to Bitcoin, all right, then we have a problem. <laughs> <Go> down. <laughs> um, and, then, and then one other kind of touchy subject, UBI, universal basic income. You know, um, I think I'm, I'm Max, I think in my Max Kaiser interview, he kind of took me off of it as in he's, he's all about what's it called universal basic millionaire no bitcoin millionaire yeah universal bitcoin millionaire you think that's a more um you know uh noble goal um as opposed to like you know but but any thoughts on i don't know on, on the concept of universal basic income is it something that's good i mean is, is there a world outside of governments maybe bitcoin based uh ubi to exist i have lots of thoughts <laughs> um <laughs> My time studying Russia and being in Russia and learning about its history, mm. when you take away the incentives, you know, society suffers, you know, like if you're, if pe people don't work as hard, like, I, I don't think this is a tough one. So 
if everything worked perfectly, UB, like UBI, I think is a really terrible idea. But I think we, the world has been so screwed up by governments that for a lot of people, it may be the only hope they have, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, and given that the government is, or the US government and many other governments are inflating our, you know, their way to infinity, you know, if they're going to be making free money anyway, like out of nowhere, I would rather it go to the people than to contractors and, you know, stupid projects from senators, blah, 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 blah. You know, like I would rather that go into people's hands and, and you know, let's try to, you know, mitigate the Cantillon effect as much as we can. Um, so, you know, if we're talking about it theoretically, I think it's a bad idea. If we're talking about it practically under certain circumstances, I may not be as opposed, like we're seeing it in the US now, I'm waiting on a stimulus check so I can go buy some Bitcoin. Um, but And for example, that 2 trillion, what percentage of it is actually doing what you said, which is like going to the people or whatever? I don't, I don't know. know Fraction exactly. or something. <laughs> yeah, sure. see. Yeah, and it's, uh, you know, I see your point though. I see your point. Um, okay, so you know what? I think we covered most of the kind of the big topics. Becky, if there's anything else you want to touch on, uh, feel free to do so like recent events or whatever. If not, maybe just bring us home, share where, uh, just like the websites, your Twitter handle, you know, where people can maybe find, uh, where people can tap into your conscious of thought. <laughs> we, we, we can't stop talking about UBI, all right? This is important. Uh, <laughs> Well, well, just one last thing on that. I, I, I'm not sure if it was Max who said it, but you, you said you were talking, seeing this. Yeah, he was my second right. interview, I think. And he's also an investor in Rukoi and all that. Okay. So he's been a friend for a long time. Yeah, I love Max. He's awesome. Um, but like a, a Bitcoin UBI, like that actually is kind of interesting to me where it's not like just printed out of thin air, but like principality states, like start mining Bitcoin and distributing it. Like that's kind of interesting. I don't know. I'm not an economic expert in that. So Dude, I don't governments know. confiscate Bitcoin from bad guys but let's call them bad guys right like if let's say whatever some guys doing something really terrible right with whatever right so then they big they confiscate bitcoin today right well what if they just took those and like you know i don't know time locked them or something so that they would become way bigger and then 10 years later started just airdropping it to everyone like that's just an easy way right or, or you know they could hold it in their reserve bank uh as an asset, uh, the Canadian yeah. Prime Minister recently, ex former Prime Minister, just alluded to that recently, um, saying that you know governments could potentially do that. Um, but yeah, but I don't know. I don't know. Bitcoin. Uh, I think that would make a lot of sense. No, like like use something like RSK or some smart contract on top of Bitcoin. And like I remember when I first got into Bitcoin, um, they used to have these things called Bitcoin faucets. Yeah. <laughs> where you could just go and get free Bitcoin. You know, you just you can just get free Bitcoin. You know, with with Bitcoin fees going so high, it wasn't possible. But now Lightning's here, so maybe it is possible. Ah, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, if you are look, if you are interested in that, by the way, do you know eToro? Mm -hmm. So there's a guy named Yanni. He's the founder of eToro. Yanni, um, is also the found. He founded a project called Good Dollar. I think it's GoodDollar.org. He presented at the OECD last year in Paris. Like, uh, as there, uh, it blew my mind. Like, he, this guy, literally is trying to do kind of what we're talking about on, you know, it's, albeit it's on the Ethereum. UBI though, he's printing tokens out of nowhere, isn't he? Or maybe I have it wrong. I don't know. But from what I understand, he's taking. What is he taking? You know, I don't even want to spend time on this, to be honest. If people are interested, maybe they should read his white paper. But from what I understand, they're taking, and I think there's a will for this, right? Because like automation, if that is the threat, right? What if you could take a percentage of the uh, profits that were generated by automation instead of just like Uncle Elon making all of it, right? What if like systemically, what if it was programmatically built in that a certain percentage went? Because like, I mean, it, for me, it's like I can... I, I don't like the idea of governments like trying to do it, right? Inflating it. To me, it just seems immoral. It's like a hidden tax, blah, blah, blah. But if Bitcoiners voluntarily, like I said, came up with some, it's like a Bitcoin faucet. It, like it existed before. It's not rocket science. And anybody, like if you're like some dying person, you're just like, ah, I need like five bucks. You can just go here and be like, Boop, oh, Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin saved me. Like you maybe need to do something, you need to upload something, right? Or whatever. But like, I don't know. It seems like a noble. Um, the other one I think about a lot is Kiva. Have you heard of Kiva or the idea of um, of microfinancing? Like you're some random dude in some random country. Yeah, you're yeah. like, I need $20 just that's like just to go buy two chickens. Huh? What? Well, that's what DeFi was supposed to be. Yeah. So, so that's what I'm saying is I think, I think to take a hard stance and be like, yo, all these guys are scams is a little much. I think 99% of them are. 
but it takes a certain type of person to be like to, to kind of be able to look there and be like yo nfts maybe there's something there maybe there can be done on bitcoin you know you know and and, and likewise you know dexes like I'm, I'm gonna hate on ethereum all day but like the idea of decentralizing an exchange how is that a bad thing? Like, like a DEX? I mean, it doesn't look great today and the code's fl- flawed and there's a million holes in it. But I think to try and solve that because centralized exchanges are a threat, yeah. you know, if you say to Bitcoin, right? Like there's so many hoops and things you need to do just because you're, you know, a centralized exchange. Um, anyways, oops, anyways, I digress. Uh, Brecky, so so any, 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 anyways, so any finishing thoughts, any any final Bitcoin bombs you want to drop on uh, on the audience out there before we close this one out? <laughs> Uh, just that, you know, we're, we're just getting started and uh, it's never too late to buy some Bitcoin. It's never too late to get involved. It's never too late to help spread the good word about Bitcoin. So, you know, if you're uh, as obsessed about this as, as I am and as Sunny is, you know, go out and do your part and contribute in whatever way you can, even if that's, you know, talking to your neighbor, talking to your mom and dad and getting them on board and telling them about sound money. So Amen. Yeah, man. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So I'm going to bring this one to a close. Brecky, thanks again for coming on the show. Really, really appreciate it. Um, okay, just stick around for like 10 seconds.